I've read that you said that it, uh, there's this huge expanse that you occupy now where, uh, you know, so much of, of gay literature, I think you, you said, just d didn't deal with fully formed human beings who just happened to be gay and were in these relationships. And suddenly this, this huge expanse is there and, and this is what, this is the, the arena you get to play in. Would that be fair to say? Well, I suppose I felt when I started uh, out writing my first book, The Swimming Pool Library, which was at the beginning of 1984, yes, I did. I mean, that, this is in the long sort of aftermath of, of this change in, in the law and in attitudes that was going on, um, that here was a, a subject of gay lives in the present and gay history, which um, really hadn't been explored in kind of literary fiction. And the depictions of sort of gay sexual behavior tended to be in pornography. And um, it, in, there were some novelists like Angus Wilson who had perfectly ordinary sort of gay characters getting on with their lives, but they were very few and far between. And some writers like Iris Murdoch, sometimes because she was so loved, all those sort of polymorphous sexual goings on that she tended to bring in very sort of sexually ambivalent characters, but, but there wasn't much of it around. So I think I did have a sense of, of opportunity. You know, here, here was a new terrain to be described. Was it opportunity or mission or a bit of both? Perhaps a bit of mission, yes. I mean, I, did, I very much didn't want a book, um, but it was written against... I, I, everything is always changing, isn't it? That's the point. You know, one's never writing about a stable situation. Um, those years of the mid-'80s when I was writing it, of course, were the years when the, the AIDS crisis really began to yeah. make its impact in, in Britain. And um, so I was... I suppose I was faced with a decision about whether I made that novel reflect these changes which were going on um, in its world um, or not, and I decided not to in the end. But nonetheless, the, the complicated and unpleasant atmosphere in the, the mid-'80s and the, the sort of anti-gay backlash that was triggered by AIDS and, um, and the general sort of obviously intense sense of um, anxiety and crisis, um, I think did, did give me, a, yes, more of a sense of political urgency about it. Well, especially earlier on, too, I mean, all that subterfuge and all that, you know, duplicity and, I mean, it's wonderful tension for bringing out characters. Well, well absolutely, yes. I mean, I, I feel, you know, I would infinitely rather live in, in the, the liberal present. Yeah. Um, but as a novelist, I, I'm, I see I'm repeatedly drawn back to eras in which being gay was much more complicated and challenging. And, and, and also probably, you know, it's a matter of being inducted into codes of behavior and so on in a way which it isn't nearly so much anymore. Um, and all that is rather fascinating to the, to the fiction writer, I think. Now, I love it when code is, is something like, so do you go back to Cambridge often? <laughs> How often do you go back to Cambridge? And that has this different way to it. And then near the end of the book, people are just texting one another saying, hey, it's Gareth, I'll see you at uh, the club, exactly. XOXO. Yeah. And you realize he was more interesting before when people kind of, were miserable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the, the, other, the other point of tension in this book is, as you said, I mean, it, it happens five different eras, 1913, 1926, 1967, 78, and 08, or thereabouts. Yeah. And, and you don't, um, the first few pages of, of every one of those sections, is, it can be quite abrupt. You're just all of a sudden transported into a, a different place, and you have to search for those characters if, they, if they're there. Who are there. I mean, that, that was something, obviously, you set out to do, but why? I'm very interested in the effects of just punching gaps in a narrative and, and seeing uh, what happens. And I, I realized if I was going to write a, a book covering 90 years without gaps, you know, it, it would be a bit on the unmanageable side. <laughs> uh, I, was, I did it a bit in the line of beauty where there, there are three sections and there are, I think yeah. there's a gap of three years between the first two sections and we finished the first section when Nick is just embarking on his first love affair. Then suddenly we jump and he's in the middle of a love affair with someone else, mm -hmm. and someone else who, moreover, had seemed completely unattainable in the first section. Mm -hmm. um, and I just thought it was an exciting and amusing way of dramatizing the, the sort of shocks and surprises and ironies of, of time passing. Um, in this particular case, I was very much encouraged, too, by some wonderful stories by one of my most revered writers, Alice Munro, mm -hmm. um, and in, in her wonderful book, uh, Runaway. She has a, um, a sequence of three stories. I mean, she can get as much into a story as most of us can get into a whole novel, you know. I mean, she has such extraordinary powers of, of sort of condensation. Um, and she's 
In a way, I wish she'd write a novel, but, uh, but uh, this, was, this sort of seemed, seemed like elements of a, of a novel, and to be as big as a novel in a way. These three stories about the life of one woman, but with these great disorienting gaps in between them, so that you rejoin the story, seeing her from a different perspective. And, um, and I found that very encouraging when I was sort of trying to think about the structural idea of, of this book. And I do hope, it's, I hope it is fun, and that the, the reader at the beginning of each new section um, is sort of disconcerted and takes a page or two to find their feet. I'd love to take some questions from the audience. Um, we've got a, a mic set up. Uh, there, love for people to get up and uh, offer their two cents, comment or question. We were told when we were coming in here that the bar had been doing quite well, so we took that as a, <laughs> as a hopeful sign that you know we'd have a few people might want to ask a question. Um, I'm interested in the process of writing, and I wonder if you have a plan, if you know in advance what the ending is. In other words, how do you write your novels? <laughs> Just a small question for you. <laughs> you think I'm going to give that away? Yeah. Uh, yes, I do have a plan, very much. I mean, uh, uh, books sort of creep up on me slowly. I, I'm not the sort of writer who, who sort of thinks, I'm going to write a book about X, and it, it all comes to me in a flash. Um, I find, usually I think, because my books have different sort of strands in them which, which cross each other, um, so things come at me from different directions, and they slowly accumulate. Um, when I feel the first sort of prickle of a new book, I, I start a new notebook and put into it anything that occurs to me in that regard, um, which might just be a fragment of conversation or a a larger plot idea or a description of a scene or anything. Um, and then after a while, the, th the thing sort of takes on more and more distinct lineaments. But I would never actually start writing the, the book until I had a pretty sure sense of the architecture of the, the whole thing. And I, I rather dread that thing, which, I mean, there are wonderful writers who do this very successfully. Um, but that thing of just starting writing and seeing what happens. You know. um, and I think partly because I write very slowly and laboriously. I dread the sort of waste, possible waste of time that that uh, would entail. Um, so I have a clear plan. I know certainly what key episodes are going to be and um, sort of revelations and um, a certain scene where someone is just going to say a certain phrase, which I might sort of treasure for hundreds of pages. Um, but there has to be quite a lot which is not, not known as well, or I think the writing of the book would just, would just be a deadly chore. Um, there must be some kinds of novel, like sort of some sorts of procedural thrillers and so on, where the, the writer has to know exactly everything that's going to happen in the book. Um, but to me, the whole charm, interest of writing is the discoveries that you make along the way. And the thing, I mean, this book was originally supposed to be only half this length, but um, in the writing, it kind of expanded as I discovered what I hoped was more interest in the material. Are you in a constant state of revision and re-editing? Not really, no. Um, so this sounds rather sort of pretentious thing to say. But I mean, I, I, I'm not a writer who makes a lot of drafts, and I think one, one reason I'm so slow is that I sort of try and get it right for the first time. I mean, of course I do revise things, but um, no, it's not a constant process of revision. Another question? Hello. Just three short questions. Do you have an ideal Re mm. reader in mind? I'm uh, sorry? Do you have an ideal reader in mind when you're writing? Were you satisfied with the television adaptation of Line of Beauty? And you're a really good writer about sex, and most people aren't. And you were really reticent in this. Is there going to be more sex in the next one? <laughs> <laughs> He wrote I'm, the New Yorker. <laughs> I'd be very amu amused by the by the reviews. Um, the, the, in com Country Life, um, I don't know if you see Country Life, <laughs> um, a wonderful magazine which has been running in England since the 1890s. I love their book reviews. Anyway, the, the reviewer of this Country book, Life wanted more sex. No, au contraire. <laughs> The, the reviewer said, thank heavens, this novel does not have the gr gratuitous descriptions of some sexual acts, which <laughs> so, so marred Mr. Hollinghurst's previous novel, The Line of Beauty. Um, but most of them have, have 
to my surprise, been complaining about it. And you know, gay and straight alike, they they want a bit more, a bit more raunch. Um, <laughs> and I'm sorry. I mean, that's about, flattering. It's because you're good at it. I'm sorry about well, it. Well, writing it. Uh, <laughs> 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 writing, <laughs> writing purely, I assure you. Uh, but, uh, and that's all the time we. Have. <laughs> uh, the um, what was the middle question? What oh, what, what you thought of the line of beauty? The um, oh yes. Um, was it BBC? I don't know. It was BBC. Yeah. Did you see it? Yes. I mean, I th I thought in general I was quite lucky with it. Did you? Yeah. I did. Yeah. Um, when you consider you know how, how awful these things can be. Um, I thought there were some wonderful actors in it who, for me, sort of made up for a lot of... The, I mean, when I saw an assembly of the first episode of it, I had this hysterical feeling that absolutely everything had been left out, uh, which I think is likely to be the, novel, the novelist's reaction. Then when I sort of calmed down and watched it again, I realised there were all the compensating virtues of, of film and that a brilliant young actor like Dan Stevens could do, just do something with a change of expression that I might have taken a whole page to describe. Um, I wish they'd had more money. You know? I mean, the good thing about a, a TV thing like miniseries is you get more airtime than you would in a cinema movie. Um, but the budget is much smaller. So the, the sort of hedonistic scenes that were supposed to be filmed in the south of France were all filmed just outside Brighton, uh, which is good. <laughs> uh, and it, it was done in a great rush in the, the, at the end of the summer, so it was actually bitterly cold, and they were like... The, 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 <laughs> The scenes that were filmed in the, in the men's bathing pond on Hampstead Heath. Uh, the, the extras were all the, the regulars who sw swim there every day of the year and the kind of leathery old things, and they were <laughs> di diving in and out at every new fresh take, you know, with no, no complaint. But the poor. I the thought poor, that they were all as tremendously <laughs> excited, but they were just cold. <laughs> but the poor, the poor quivering young, young boys who had to. Had, I mean, after every take, they had to be wrapped in sheets of silver foil and given, <laughs> given hot water bottles. I mean, it was very, very comic. Um, but no, I think, it, I think Andrew Davis is very skillful at knowing what has to be done to a novel to turn it into this, this obviously different medium. And um, you know, he said to me quite frankly at the beginning that he preferred his authors dead. Uh, because you know, norm, normally he's dealing with Jane Austen or Dickens or something. But of course it was quite useful being able to email me and ask me some detail about what a character might have done, which of course, to be honest, I rarely new. I mean, the extraordinary thing is, that, you know, in a novel you only see what is on the page. In a film you see everything that's on, on the screen and everybody has to have a face and a frock and a voice. Um, so, I, 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 to me, it was a fascinating education in the whole, whole business of what film adaptation means. There was another question, wasn't there? He's got a lot we, of questions I think we hit all there. three, though. Right. Oh, yes. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, no, I don't, is the answer. Um, I think it may have been something to do with writing a uh, you know, very sort of conspicuous gay, gay book to start with, and actually not wanting to feel that I, feeling that I didn't want to be set up as a sort of representative gay writer who had to sort of follow anybody else's agenda, because I always wanted to do my, my own rather sort of peculiar thing. Um, and really, I just shut out any, any sense of what anybody might be expecting of me. And occasionally, I think a friend might enjoy a particular joke or something, but I, no, I, I don't think of a, a reader at all. Um, I really enjoyed your novel, and one of the themes that I, I found quite fascinating in it was sort of the, the art in the sense of, of writing a biography, and not only just because cultural um, things change over the decades, but also that you know, people's memories fade, um, they, they rethink things, I mean, you know, your, your fictional biographer of Cecil in, in this book is trying to interview people, you know, 40, 50, 60 years after events that have happened. And it occurred to me, you know, we're really living in a sort of self-righteous age of memoir writing where everything has to be the truth and, you know, people get caught out and there's huge scandals and so forth. And I wondered if some of the difficulties of writing biographies that you explore in this novel is a reaction to that, uh, you know, in the last couple of years um, and, and what your own views are. I, I know you're not a biographer, but if, if you do read biography and what your own views are as a reader approaching biography in terms of how much you're willing to accept is the truth or, you know, can be embellished by the biographer and so forth? Well, I was terribly 
I mean, I don't think this is a book I would have written 10 years ago, probably. I mean, as I get older, I'm so struck by the fallibility of my own memory uh, and as of my, my memory for, as a, a, a basis for sort of constructing a, a real narrative of my, my own past. Um, and the whole question which strikes me so much in re reading memoir, for instance, where people give quite long verbatim accounts of conversations they perhaps had 30 years before. I mean, I, I think it's very hard to remember more than a few words that someone said to me last week, you know, much less. <laughs> but no, seriously. And I, um, I suppose if you, if you keep a journal every day, then there's more likelihood of accuracy. But even a journal is a, an act of selection, interpretation. There's, you know, there's, there's going to be, it's going to be shaped, and there is a, the, li the likelihood of something almost fictional creeping, creeping into any account one makes of one's own life. Um, so that was some, so, something that I very much wanted to explain. How, how, how confident we, can we be of knowing anything about, about the past? Um, letters written at the time you know, are, are liable to be very subjective, too. Um, they will reveal certain emotional truths, um, but they're perhaps not of the ultimate documentary um, value. Um, and poor old Daphne in, in, in this book has, has written a memoir herself, which is widely disparaged, uh, and she has a, a, long, a long dark night ref reflect, reflecting on this book and saying how that she was fairly sure that things she'd made the characters say had been said by them within five or at the outside ten years of when she said they'd said it, but she couldn't be quite sure. Um, and the other problem, which I, I admit to having detected in myself as well, that she can't really remember anything that happened after about 6.45 in the evening because she's had a couple of drinks. Uh, <laughs> and in fact, all evening sort of blur into one. Uh, so, so I think that was... I mean, there, there is, as, as we were saying, there's, there's another sort of story about biography moving from the, the era, the sort of late Victorian era, really, when you, a reader of a biography at the time of the beginning of this book would not have expected to learn anything about the intimate life of the subject the reader of a biography in 2008, and it would feel positively cheated not to be given every detail of, of what someone got up to. Um, so there's been this, yes, this erosion of the idea of privacy and um, this sort of mania for self-exposure, um, which I've, I'm also rather skeptical of. So, so what are you looking for when you read a biography? Well, I mean, there are good biographies and bad ones, aren't there? I mean, I've, I mean of course, there are great biographies, like the one of... Michael Holroyd's Life of Lytton Strachey that I was just mentioning. And there are, there are biographers who are, who are great writers, I think. Um, and I, I suppose I'm looking for that kind of humane um, intelligence and experience, which you know, might make a great novelist as well. Um, in this book, I, I, I very much wanted to play with the idea of, of bad biographers. And something which often strikes me, that the life of a, a minor person whose life is probably only going to be written once often falls into the hands of, of some crank you know, who, who does a terrible job on it. Um, and so that was the sort of, sort of comedy of, of biography going wrong that I wanted to address in this book. I think we have time for another question or two, if anybody has one. Please. I find that a lot of your books talk a great deal, but almost as a secondary topic, as of the class system and how a lot of the gay people are oftentimes from privileged classes and are able to live full gay lives or working classes and it's on, on the side. But also the set pieces in your books, like the Thatcher birthday party um, in Line of Beauty, um, cocktail parties in this one, uh, the weekend at Corley Court, they're these incredible comedies of manners that are almost kabuki-like in the British class system of never really saying anything. Everything comes up with a question mark because nobody wants to actually take a, a stance on something. <laughs> and what sound like wonderful compliments are actually terrible put downs. And everybody seems a little confused as to what actually is being said around them. And I wonder, first of all, if you're worried about, clearly it's something that translates to a, a reader abroad. Um, do, you, or do you get worried that it might be a little too arcane? And second of all, how do you how have you been able to be exposed to these things in order to be able to talk about them with such control? You really seem to understand the ins and outs in a, in a very controlled way and to make them so amusing. Um, well, I suppose just by 
noticing and watch, watching and listening. I, mean, I, I didn't ever hang around with Mrs. Thatcher and myself, but I found, I found it quite possible to imagine what it would be, be like to be in, in her sort of mesmerized um, circle. Um, I suppose you know, one knows things from life and one knows things from, um, from reading about them, and um, particularly the earlier parts of the book, which happened before I was alive, um, were, were, were different experiences. Um, and the, you know, those are much the most sort of class-ridden parts of the book um, from writing about the later sections when I was alive. Um, and I realized, I mean, writing the section set in 1913, um, that most of what we know about how people spoke and conducted themselves in 1913 comes from reading novels set in that period and probably watching um, films based on those novels. Um, and there is something sort of irreducibly literary about our sense of the past. So I think you know, a, lot, a lot of it I probably sort of absorbed and synth synthesized out of my own reading as, as well as my, uh, my um, own observation. Um, and perhaps that's how novelists go about things in general. Um, I, do, I, I could confess I don't worry about whether people will be able to understand it in different cultures, uh, whether its nuances will be apparent. Because um, I think if you did that, you would then be constantly sort of simplifying and sort of dumbing down your, your perceptions to meet some purely again, some purely imaginary reader who, who, you know, who might not um, quite be able to un understand what you were saying. Um, so I just sort of do my thing, really. Alan, thank you very much for your time and for this wonderful thank conversation you, with our audience. Thank you. Thank you very much.